The writing of this video script has been a struggle, mostly because I have been wanting to get my point across without it being misinterpreted as something it is not. Then again, if I fail to get my point across here, I get called out on it. Doing a follow-up video is always an option. Simply put, Batman's no-killing rule has not aged very well since it was first incepted into the character's lore. Basically, about a lot before Zack Snyder's Justice League came out, a much more successful YouTuber than me, called Tex, made a video explaining Batman's no-killing rule. In his video, Tex pointed out its origin having spawned from the 1940s comic book censorship, where the editors of the Batman comics at the time wanted their target audience to be young children. Because of this, Batman's creators Bob Kane and Bill Finger were forced to change how they had originally set the character up in Detective Comics 27, and Batman was pretty much turned into the source material leading up to Adam West's Batman TV show in the 1960s. The 1970s and 1980s moved on to return the character back to how he was initially set up, probably because those young children the early comics were aimed at had grown up to become adults during that time. The no-killing rule survived through all that and evolved from a censorship mandate into a part of the character, which we should all agree has not aged as well as it could have been and should so be updated. Let me clarify what I mean by that. I am not a fan of the idea of Batman being a murderer who actively kills people as his default action when fighting crime. As far as I'm concerned, Batman can and he should approach most situations where he plans how to keep the people he interacts with alive, with and without hostility. However, where there is smoke there is fire, and when you are confronting people who are willing to kill you, there is bound to be collateral damage. For this reason, I feel that Batman's no-killing rule should be updated into a no-murdering rule. Mostly because Batman can in some cases, by merely existing or by being present in a situation, cause people to die, and he will then be accused of having been the one who killed them. Are you... You brought this craziness on us! You did! You brought this on us! For example, in the first issue of The Legend of the Dark Knight from 1989, written by the legend that was Dennis O'Neill, Leslie Tompkins clinic is raided by Gotham's usual hoodlums for medicine and other drugs. They also take a pregnant woman who was there as a patient as their hostage because they are likely also thinking that they can get away with what they are doing and going to do. When Batman appears, he uses the criminals are superstitious and cowardly lock tactic when confronting the hoodlums, and while it works as well as it is expected, it unfortunately also works on the hostage, who was already hysterical over her pregnancy and the threat of whatever the hoodlums would have done to her. So seeing Batman appearing like an eldritch being and brutalize the hoodlums, she reacts as she would be expected to, aka refuses to let what she sees as the monster in the night to do the same to her. Batman, by merely existing, killed this woman. These early issues of The Legends of the Dark Knight were set after Frank Miller's Year One, and already Batman's no-killing rule has been broken on his second year. He did not push the knife into her heart, but he was the cause of why she did it to herself. You saw what was happening. You knew something was terribly wrong with me. You should have been able to help me. But you didn't. And another example. In the opening of Batman Ego, written and drawn by the legend that was Darwin Cook, Batman has managed to capture the Joker because he interrogated and threatened one of his men, named Buster Snips. Batman suspects that the money that the Joker had stolen prior to the story's events is hidden somewhere by Buster, so he followed him even when battle damaged from having caught the Joker. Ultimately, Buster stops at the Gotham Bridge and climbs up to what Batman initially believes to be where the money had been stashed, but then realizes that Buster is really there to jump. 
Batman stops Buster and pulls him back to safety while losing blood from his poorly treated wounds while letting Buster know that the Joker has been apprehended. Buster in exchange rants back that the Joker will be back on the streets eventually because the state of New Jersey where Gotham is located doesn't practice the death penalty anymore. And when the Joker will be back on the streets, Buster knows he will come to repay for ratting him to the Batman on his family. I couldn't bear the thought of my wife and daughter at the hands of that maniac, so I killed them myself. And then Buster points the gun at himself, with Batman acknowledging that by his actions to apprehend the Joker, he was the one who killed Buster's wife and daughter by pushing him into it. No killing rule broken once again. By those examples, Batman was responsible for four deaths. And if most Batman fan purists are to be believed, the number of Batman's killed victims should be zero. This is why, in my opinion, the no killing rule should be updated to a no murder rule to acknowledge that Batman can kill people by accident or as the result of his actions where the cause and the effect were originally separated from each other. The fact that Batman decides not to kill doesn't mean that his actions can't lead to people dying, and when it comes to him confronting people who are willing to kill, the circumstances would need to have his opponents also not use deadly force against him because of the collateral damage. And it is because of this collateral damage, again, why the no-kill rule can lead to people dying if Batman refuses to save a life because it can lead to someone else dying as the result, and his inactivity can then lead to deaths anyway. Then when put into a kill or be killed situation, should Batman just lay down and die? No, because in doing that, Batman would then sentence all the people he could have the chance to save in the future to die eventually. I believe you. Batman has been told multiple times that he cannot save everyone. And it is usually because of that why he then tries extra hard to save the next person he can. Like how after being brought back to his senses by Superman and Lois Lane, Batman tried to save both Ma Kent and Anatoly Knaisev at the end of the warehouse fight in BDS. There are people who still insist that Batman murdered Anatoly by shooting at the flamethrower's tank, when it is clear for everyone to see that there was a delay between the shot and the explosion, as Anatoly took aim at Ma Kent and pulled the trigger of his flamethrower. Batman didn't kill anyone during the warehouse fight, as I previously showcased in part 4 of my BBS Unbiased review, although there were the four confirmed casualties of which Batman was not directly responsible, as medical professionals have confirmed. Links to their videos are down in the description. And if Batman wanted to kill Anatoly in this situation, as some people still insist, the much more easier ways would have been to shoot Anatoly in the head, torso, femoral, Moral artery or anywhere else on his body to make him unable to burn Magen with the flamethrower. That is an example of how Batman tries to save two lives, or three if you count the gun murk, but fails and only manages to save one. And to the purists and fanboys slash fangirls, yes, shit like this can happen. But your demand should still be met because Batman did go out of his way to try keep everyone in the room alive. It will happen this way. You make the kill. So you run out into the night to find another and 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 another. A contrast to this is in Batman Forever, where that movie expects you to accept that Batman sets up Two-Face to die and doesn't even try to save his life, as those same purists and fanboys slash fangirls demand. Previously in that movie, there is a subplot likely meant to carry over from the Tim Burton movies, where Michael Keaton's Batman having killed Jack Nicholson's Joker and many of the Penguin's men, was supposed to be carried over with Val Kilmer's Batman having PTSD from all that killing. In the movie, there is a scene between Kilmer's Bruce Wayne talking to Chris O'Donnell's Dick Grayson about wanting just one person dead and then getting hooked on it because the pain won't go away from 
Later in the climax, there is a scene where Batman tries to delay Tommy Lee Jones' jewel face from killing him, Robin and Nicole Kidman by reminding him to flip his coin to choose their fates instead. Ignoring the fact that Two-Face could have flipped his coin before ambushing them, or that the movie had the entire coin flipping logic ignore whichever side it lands on its final, following Harvey throwing his coin into the air, Batman throws more coins into the air to make him lose track which one is his coin and then fall into his death. This was likely done for the following reasons. 1. Two-Face knew Batman was Bruce Wayne and it was logical to have him die not to tell anyone. 2. To save Robin from killing slash wanting to kill Two-Face who had taken Tony Zuko's role in killing the Flying Graysons. However, if Batman was written with more understanding of the character, it would have been better if his plan was to grab or incapacitate Two-Face as he was falling not to kill him. Or better, have Robin be the one grabbing and incapacitating Two-Face to show Batman he is not the same as he said earlier, that he is better than Batman and Batman can look at Robin, proud that he is not like him. You finally learn to do what is necessary. I won't kill you, but I don't have to save you. So to summarize, when it comes to Batman, or maybe not even just Batman as this could work with every superhero, I draw the line in killing or causing deaths to malice slash premeditation and the lack of them. Meaning, I'm okay if a hero causes someone to die as an after effect of their actions. However, it's a completely another thing if the hero goes for the kill as their first cause of action. This is what separates murder from manslaughter and a killer from a murderer. The recent Batman comic event Shadow War ended with Damian Wayne's Robin telling Geoforce after his drastic actions as a fallen hero that heroes don't kill, similarly as The Rock's Black Adam told Aldis Hodges Hawkman in the Black Adam trailer. My problem about this slogan is that kills can still happen without intention and the heroes involved should not be branded as murderers for failing to save lives. It is only when the heroes plan to cause deaths and actually end up making those people die as they planned, that is when they have crossed the line. Geoforce crossed that line because of duty to his people and other personal reasons, while Black Adam crossed that line because it is in his character to go for the easy way. But they still cross that line that separates an accidental killer from an active murderer. They are the extreme examples of not like this when it comes to a heroic characters becoming a shadow of their former selves as stated by the heroes don't kill mantra. Let me remind you of Tex's video where he brought up that the entire no killing rule was made up as an editorial mandate which was more than clearly done as a way to not have recurring villains killed off and to not have heroes act unheroically. And by now it has been passed from one generation of writers who grew up reading about Batman and other heroic characters with this code to another generation over and over again like a game of broken telephone. Since the turn for killing can mean multiple different things from active murder to doing nothing and so allowing something to happen, we should really get the no killing rule updated into a no murdering rule. Especially because some heroes have allowed the villains they have not killed to go kill more people, not even by supporting the judicial prosecutors into pushing for the death penalty to have those villains be killed a justified way that supports the laws they protect. In the Joker's case, the insanity plea should have failed by now, and the exception to give him the lethal injection should have happened already. Okay, how many times have I already said this, and how many more times do I need to keep trying to explain it? You know what? If this video gets any kind of feedback in questioning me or challenging my point, I will do a follow-up video in responding to those comments. 
Comment what you think about the no kill rule being updated to a no murder rule. Or if you have a better idea on how to move on from that outdated mandate. Also, share the video so more people can hear what I think about it. Subscribing for the other videos is also an option and may your heart be your guiding key.